Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studios. Andrew, the security guy here today. I know you were hoping to see Professor Dave. He's busy. I ain't sure what he's doing. He's a hardworking guy, but I got another really hardworking guy in here, a special guest today. Will Bales is here from the Honolulu Field Office. Thank you so much. Appreciate you taking the time to come in and talk with us today. My pleasure. We, um, this issue, this episode, I wanted to get a new program that the FBI has rolled out to the public. Um, and this is about combating foreign influence. And it's, it's really about the foreign influence that's gotten into the fabric of our, of our uh, society uh, in a lot of ways through social media. And um, I want to give you a brief before we get to talking with Will about this, some of the stuff that uh, FBI Director Ray uh, talked about that you may not understand um, how influential our adversaries are becoming and some of the things that they do. And here's just a few of the examples that he cited uh, from the investigations that they've done. Um, they basically are targeting U.S. officials and other U.S. persons um, through, you know, a traditional intelligence uh, tradecraft. They're, uh, there are criminal efforts to suppress voting and provide illegal campaign financing. They are using cyber attacks against voting infrastructure. That means our, the, the networks and the equipment that are used to vote, along with computer intrusions targeting elected officials and others. So they're trying to get into their systems and steal information from it to use against them or maybe for them, depending on which way they want to sway people. Um, and a whole slew of other types of influence that are overt and covertly manipulating news stories um, spreading disinformation, leveraging economic resources, uh, or escalating just divisive issues in our community. And um, it's not just an election cycle threat. I mean, these are the kind of threats they're using to sort of break apart the fabric of our country uh, over, over anything they can to just cause uh, disillusionment with uh, uh, maybe uh, our, our leadership of our country, you know? And that that's damaging in and of itself. When people lose trust in the um, sort of fabric, the, the foundations of our country, right? This is a problem. So I thought I'd get this out here today um, since Dave's not here and, uh, and Will's going to try to help me get through it. First of all, I thought, Will, we go back and look at um, sort of the rise of social media, right? It had, there was a lot of hope for connecting people. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I believe that these Mark Zuckerberg and all these guys ha had a, an idea there. Like, wow, cool technology, we can all share. And it's, it's gone kind of crazy, maybe. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think we ever thought it would be weaponized. Right. And what, uh, so what, give us your, uh, your take on that there. That was broad, sorry. No, no, that's, <laughs> that's fine. It, it, it really is, social media is just like the internet. The creation of it is an amazing thing, mm. and it's, it's for the benefit of everybody. However, select few individual or many individuals are just using that to do a lot of harm. So social media has morphed into, like you said, connecting users. Kind of primarily started at maybe the college age, and now it's branched out so it's easier to use, and so we have all generations that are using social media. Um, but I also don't think that social media was created to be the single source of information, ah. which it seems to be for a lot of individuals these days. Yeah, you wonder if people get blinded, right? You, get, you, you throw your opinion out or you, you latch on to an opinion of someone, all of a sudden you find yourself either by chance or by manipulation in a whole group of people that seem to be like-minded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, more and more, especially with social media and the internet as a whole, it's easier and easier to just pigeonhole yourself into more like-minded, you know, mm -hmm. areas or subforums or whatever it might be. So then you're going to only be surrounded by that type of information. So it is great for connecting other people, but it also is very easy to disconnect from uh, a certain group uh, of other people. Isn't that something that uh, sort of isolating you without you knowing it? If you're if you're if you're not thinking about this this potential that someone's maliciously exercising influence against you. You could right. be joining a group of people that you think uh, like to knit the way you do, and you all make the greatest sweaters in the world, and none of them actually exist, right? right? It's all fake. Yeah. <laughs> it's really scary stuff. You know, I sat um, uh, this past week up at InfraGuard National in a, in a, a room uh, talking about um, the counterintelligence efforts that we've got going on, and um, the director shared with us that the uh, shift towards recruitment for, um, are they, uh, HVEs, 
violent extremists, homegrown mm -hmm. violent extremists, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. has recruiting, they're recruiting from the internet. They've seen a massive shift of that through social media in the last three years. Right, before when people talk about cyber crime or just cyber in general, it was kind of the, the geeky mindset is people just hacking computers. Now there's a huge just migration of traditional crime, organized crime, recruitments, whether it's homegrown extremists or uh, ISIL type of symp sympathizers. Mm -hmm. Everything is now on the internet because it's, it's easy it's often anonymous, mm -hmm. uh, and just the convenience of it makes it so that you can get connected or informed by whatever individual that you want to. So, of course, these criminal organizations are using that, you know, internet platform to recruit uh, and get their word out. Mm. Yeah, I um, was ha happened to take a, a visit to D.C. this year with uh, the Federal Law Enforcement Foundation and got to meet a lot of different groups. It's amazing how much you guys all work together. Mm -hmm. And then we, we got to meet Interpol finally, who seemed to be the the nexus of, you know, the knowing what these guys over in this country do mm -hmm. and knowing if they're over here. And I thought that was amazing that we've, we've got that sort of information sharing. Um, I understand that this um, foreign intelligence is a new uh, task force. Could you give the audience a feeling of just what what, what is a, a task force when it's new like that or sure. uh, whatever uh, you can share there? A task force is vital, especially for combating something so complicated or as broad and big as cybercrime or foreign influence. So a task force is essentially not just one agency. It can be local, maybe comprised of local police departments, mm. as well as state. Of course, federal, we're going to have multiple types of different agencies involved in this task force. DHS, FBI, uh, all the different types of intelligence services that might be involved with this. So with that as a task force, we're a united front sharing information amongst each other. Maybe the locals, local PD gets some kind of on the ground, boots on the ground type of information that this uh, person has been handing out a lot of these different pamphlets. Mm -hmm. Now we at the federal level, we might not have an, uh, kind of a view or that high level of view into something that granular, I but see. the locals then can pass it through the task force and now we all have that information. We share it amongst each other and then there, of course, are different task force that might comprise of our foreign counterparts because cyber is a very global issue. Mm. We have to make sure that we're either working for Interpol or with Europol and all of our foreign colleagues to get this information, this, this vital information, out to our partners. Yeah, I was um, I shared some statistics with this about the, the you know, we, we don't hear much about terrorism. In the, in, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. lately, mm -hmm. but that that's because I think of all this sharing. The he kind of said that the volume of the caseload of, in, of current investigations is kind of the same, mm -hmm. and uh, the volume of arrests, which aren't always terrorism related, you find a way to, to uh, the, we find a way uh, illegality of someone right. based on maybe a state law or a local law or something they're doing wrong, that they can be brought off the street so they don't go active and, and right. really cause a problem. Right. Uh, especially with counterterrorism investigations uh, for the, the world, no news is good news. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. what I was thinking. Like, I don't think people know that, right? right? Like, they don't hear about stuff, so they think it faded away. In fact, our, some of the security presentations I've been doing, and I tell people, you know, we as security professionals, we haven't been talking as much about uh, terrorist activity. We were talking about the vehicle ramming activity, mm -hmm. and that wasn't always necessarily terrorist related. So mm -hmm. that that was on the rise, and so you know it's just a different change in, in the in what we've talked about. But that was a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's uh, let's change just a little bit. Um, the the director talked about you know that that I think the traditional things that the bureau's always done um, you know information tells and sharing that you just mentioned but um, this uh, this uh, the third pillar of the approach he said is a, is based on a strong relationship with the private sector and I don't think the public at large knows a lot of this if you're not affiliated with InfraGuard or the the Citizens Academy uh, or FLEF you know you may not understand that this is happening. Um, and he pointed out that the technology companies have a really frontline responsibility to secure their networks, products, and platforms. Um, they're doing, uh, he says, we're doing our part by providing actionable intelligence to better enable them to address abuse of their platforms by foreign actors. Um, this year, they're meeting with top social media and technology companies uh, many times, giving them classified briefings and sharing specific threat indicators and account information so they can better monitor their own platforms. Um, do you do you have a feeling um, or, or vision on uh, th that response reception? I guess from that message from social media, because that's their revenue generating. You know, I think many of us are aware they make money off 
visiting and clicking and moving through their, their sites. Do you, um, do you think they're as helpful as the, those of us who are, are definitely out here working on InfraGuard and places? I never saw a Google guy at InfraGuard, for example. But I'm sure they're there in Silicon Valley. I didn't want to. Right. It's definitely a balance that they have to, to do. Of course, their main objective is you know, their business. Yeah, sure. So Gotta make money. marketing, making money, things like that. But now more and more cybersecurity is just such a big deal. At the bare, bare minimum, it's a reputation hit. If there's some kind of mm. breach or just something that sh uh, makes it the, the company have a little bit of doubt mm -hmm. associated with them. Mm -hmm. So I think more and more private sector is treating cybersecurity with the respect and um, just kind of importance that it deserves. But we do have room to improve. Yeah. Do you think it took like GDPR in Europe, you know, and, and the U.S. looking at that going, whoo, because the pendulum could really swing a long way and, and hurt their business model if they don't come to the table. Right. And, and GDPR <laughs> has, uh, there's a lot of implications that's yet to be found out sure. on, on that one. Uh, privacy, of course, is extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, something, of course, the FBI is very familiar with, yes. uh, with, with the past. And, and we respect that. We definitely want to make sure that we are treating our citizens, because that's, that's what we are. We are public servants. Yes. As, as government officials and workers, we are protecting our civilians and citizens of the United States. So it is something we have to balance, uh, privacy as well as just the interaction, because we need to make sure that the intelligence that we're getting at the FBI is shared appropriately with the private sector mm -hmm. so that they never have to worry about just not knowing. Sure. If we, if we provide that to them as best as we can, then they can try to hopefully fend off. Yeah. I, um, I, I, I really wish that if more people knew, I think, the, the depth of privacy protection that goes into the investigations that you folks do. I think they would wish that business functioned that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> business functions a whole lot more loosely than the myriad laws that you guys have to move through. It's always amazing when I hear of an investigation briefing, everything that goes on. Um, so um, you think the public should be able to count on, um, you know, I mean, I know there's a, a thing with Facebook going on today, for example, but do you think the public should be able to count on m more and growing support from these large social media um, companies? Do you think that's the trend? Even though it's we're pushing them and prodding them a little now, maybe they'll... They'll continue I, to come our way. <laughs> I hope so. I hope that they continue to, to have that momentum into a more secure environment. We went from probably not even a decade ago that passwords were just clear text. Yeah. You know, that was kind of a standard <laughs> practice to have clear text passwords just stored in a mm -hmm. lot of these companies. Now, of course, we know better than that, uh, but we do in our investigations come across a lot of private sector individuals or companies that still operate that way. Mm. So I think a lot of it has to come down to education, which sure. is why we're trying to educate the public. That's why we're here today. Yeah. Sure. We, um, what we're going to do, we're going to step into some of the elements of this, uh, a lot, well, let me should say, alongside the Combating Foreign Influence Task Force, some of the output of that has been a program the FBI has released called uh, Protected Voices. And um, there are several elements in that, uh, I think 10 or 12, which, which only give us about a minute each after the break. But we will uh, come back and we'll, Passwords is going to be one of those. We're going to talk about some of those elements and kind of direct you to where uh, you can get this information if you, 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 know, you don't know what's going on or you don't know how to get started or you're not sure if your company is using clear text or not using HTTPS or whatever your problems may be. Uh, you can get some guidance here. So uh, give us about a minute to pay some bills and we'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Hello. My name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pomai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time.
Hey, aloha, and welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studios. Uh, Andrew, the security guy here with Will Bales from the Honolulu Field Office. Today, we are, we are kicking through combating foreign influence for a little bit, which is a new task force that the FBI set up uh, based on some of this election stuff, but it, it has implications for all the social media out there. So be careful where you play. Um, an outgrowth of this um, task force has been some um, videos that they've generated. Uh, and this information uh, is called Protected Voice. Uh, protected Voices program, and I thought we'd just kind of walk through the elements of it and maybe sort of reinforce some of the stuff you'll see, but I, these are two, three, four minute videos uh, on, on a variety of topics that are great information if you want to figure out what to do or you're not sure if you're doing all the things you should be doing. Uh, and again, what we'll do is just sort of overview these. We're not going to play all these videos. We don't have time. Um, but it's, it's on the same website, so just go to, if you just go to Combating Foreign Influence, you'll end up right here at Protected Voices. So. Social engineering. I think we were sort of kicking that around. Um, I'm not sure if people know how vulnerable they are to social engineering. Do you do you come across a lot of, uh, of uh, investigative um, uh, avenues or, or places where people that was the origin of the exploit in, in their their problems that, that arose in their company? Absolutely. Uh, social social engineering is very interesting because <laughs> it usually has a lot of clever wording. Um, people, the, I don't want to say problem, but the problem with people is we're trusting. Isn't that? In, in nature. Yeah, like we're supposed to be, but it's a problem. <laughs> right. Uh, so with that, then people will, a lot of times through phone calls, they'll call into a company, I need my password reset, or I forgot my, my email, or uh, my information, or whatever, and just the companies and people in general are trusting of the other person on the end of the phone. So they will reset the password, or the email, mm. or whatever it might be. Uh, with good intentions, of course, but obviously on the other side of the phone is a subject or a bad guy. A uh, criminal. Yes, a criminal. Let's call them criminals. We yeah. don't call them hackers anymore. <laughs> hackers are good and bad. We yes. call them criminals. Right. Uh, and, and with that, they can, maybe they just want to get your credit report or they sure. change something around. Uh, that, of course, affects an individual and it's inconvenient, but in the grand scope of things, not as big. Or they go into your corporate network. Uh, they get the password reset, and now they have user access into whatever it might be. Mm. Uh, and then from there, they can pivot into a lot of different things because people use same passwords. Um, mm. It's definitely a, definitely a big problem. Yeah, we're going to get to password usage here, so Hannah, don't think you don't do it. We know you do. Um, so um, video number two is about patching. Patching firewalls and then uh, antivirus. And to me, firewall is a little bigger animal than patching and AV. Let's, mm. talk, about, let's talk about patching first. Um, what, what do you see, you know? Uh, you know, when you go out there and, and look at, when you need to find things, are they unpatched? <laughs> often, very, very, very Does often. that help you? Yes. <laughs> yes, uh, and, and unfortunately, so we understand things that are unpatched, mm -hmm. but we, and I, I wanna say we understand it, but there's instances where we see something's unpatched for multiple years. Yeah, yeah years, how, how, how is that? that? That one's a little bit more frustrating yeah. because that's, of course, could have been remedied and prevented and uh, we have other things we could have been doing. But we also do understand that, especially if you're a large organization and with the patching and things like that, it's not just a one click and everything's all hunky-dory because often when you patch something, something else is gonna fail, there's mm. all the testing and things like that. So we do understand that it's easy just to say, patch everything. Um, we're still gonna say it, because you do need to patch. Yeah, best you can, for sure. Right. And then know the implications of it. You know, you, not everybody can have a development environment to do their beta testing of patches and all right. that. So yeah, understood. Um, AV. Do you find AV updated? Is it you know? So we got you got sort of the, the the local machine version, and then you've got it you know run on maybe on the firewall and a little more of a monitor type version. Um, what do you see in the small business taking advantage of that? Um, yeah, AV has been something that is for the most part it's there. the The problem is is that they have an uphill battle mm -hmm. because malware is being able to change so so easily so often. Um, you can't just do things by hashes anymore. Of course, it has to be signature based, and mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely something that uh, the AV companies have their work cut out for them. But a bare minimum, somebody should have AV software on their computer because it has a baseline. It gets rid of most of the traffic or malicious attempts towards your computers. Uh, the sophisticated ones might be a little bit different, but you're going to filter out 99% of the issues out there. Yeah. The you don't want to get beat by the old stuff, right. <laughs> the stuff that we know about, and that AV will at least stop that. Um, 
Firewall is a little bigger animal, maybe outside the expertise of many, but um, how about the stuff about the home user and his firewall settings? You think he plugs it in, gets internet, and he's done? <laughs> right. <laughs> Whoops. Right. Uh, <laughs> firewalls and then similar to the routers, which is another yeah. topic point, um, default is not good. No, never. Uh, especially when you're using default credentials with whether it's firewall or routers. Admin, admin. Right. Uh, that's, <laughs> Whoops. That's, we see that way too too common. And oh. of course, with, with websites out there like Shodan and whatnot, that just really shows all the different uh, unfortunate individuals that leave default credentials uh, in place. Uh, firewalls need to make sure that you, of course, update them, uh, customize them if possible, um, but at the bare minimum, make sure you're, you're changing default stuff. Yeah, and turn off, turn off that external management. You're not going to manage it from somewhere else. Turn that off, mm -hmm. that remote port. You don't need it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Passwords is in here, a video for passwords. We have been harping on passwords for so many years now. Let's give them, give me your top three advice for passwords and then we'll move on. Uh, stop using the same ones. Yes, <laughs> we know you do. And don't use short ones. Uh, yes. That's another thing. Um, the longer, the better. Uh, they used to be, you know, as long as you use different characters and made it kind of complex, then, then that would mean you're safe. That's no longer the case. It's just because of all the different uh, computing power that we have out there. So yeah. longer is better. There are password managers out there. Uh, yeah. We don't recommend specific ones, but if you have a good one, make sure that the the password for the password manager is extremely brutal <laughs> and complex uh, and two-factor yes. with that um, so that you can make sure that you kind of manage that properly. Yeah, I love the point of two-factor. It's rolled out into almost everything now. Go turn it on. If it's available for whatever that site is, whatever you're doing, turn on two-factor. I know it's a little bit of a headache, you know, but mm -hmm. use a Google Authenticator, use Microsoft Authenticator, use a text. Text is less, I guess it depends on what you're doing, but you know, take advantage of it. Passwords just aren't, I hope they don't last much longer. I hope we just move away and I'd like a triple biometric and I want it to, I want it to know where I'm geolocated. I want a whole bunch of stuff where it lets me in, but I'm different from a lot of people. Um, oh, this is a good one. Br browsers and then application safety. And by that, I think we probably mean mobile apps. Let's talk about browsers first, the, the settings in browsers. Mm -hmm. So browsers, of course, is what we use to surf the internet. Yes. Uh, make sure that they're updated. Uh, there's a lot of these attachments or extensions on the browsers. You have to make sure that when you install those, you know what you're install installing. There's a lot of malicious ones out there. Uh, of course, there's also uh, different types of scripts and scripting that, it, mm -hmm. that a browser can run. If you want to be safe, you disable that. Mm -hmm. um, you you kind of mentioned it. Security is inconvenient. Yes. So unfortunately, a lot of the things that to, to make you a real secure individual on the internet is an inconvenience. Yes. So the more that you feel very frustrated and things are inconvenient, that probably means that you're doing it right. Yeah, don't, don't take that high security browser setting and start lowering it yeah. so your life is easier. Leave it up there and live with it. Depending on what you're doing, of course. Correct. You know, if you're looking at Mickey Mouse videos, well, maybe they could be bad, but I, I don't know how many malicious guys target Mickey Mouse to serve to people. But um, So let's talk about browser uh, mobile apps a little bit. Um, I know the, some of the stores recently have, have kicked up their getting rid of guys with bad, known bad code and known bad libraries and things like that. So what's your, what's your take on that? I mean, I'm, I'm always scared, mm -hmm. especially like I'm updating. I'm uh, updating twice a week the same app. Like, what's the problem there? Well, uh, more and more, our lives are going to be on our phones. Yeah. So that means that the computers that we're using is all going kind of migrated to the phones. And everything on a phone is an app. The, the malicious or the criminals that are targeting uh, mobile platforms is not going to go away. That's only going to increase. So we have to be very, very uh, cautious of the apps that we download. Um, make sure that it's from a reputable company. Mm -hmm. uh, you've yeah, done a little bit get, of research. Don't get those weird ones. <laughs> right. If, if uh, an app is usually paid, why is this one similarly named and it's free? You know, you got to be really skeptical yeah. uh, with downloading these apps. And there's a lot of bloatware out there anyway. So maybe it's not even malicious, but do you really need to download that one more game app uh, yeah. on your phone? And you download it, now your phone's slow to a crawl and right. all the battery. Do you wonder what it's doing to drain that battery? Siphoning off everything you are and everything you've ever known and sending it to somebody. Woo! Um, let's talk about comms real quick. Just the, the kind of information that people put out. You know, talking 
third party talking in the hallway, you know, the, co just communicating about important uh, assets of your information, important operational elements of your of your of your your company, or, or perhaps your important elements of your you know financial aspects of your own life at the mall with your sister and talking too loud with people standing around. Mm -hmm. um, how much intel are people giving away out there that, that they're not aware of? Tons, <laughs> absolutely tons. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, you don't have to work for the government to be paranoid about the information that you're conveying out yeah. there. Uh, not everything needs to be classified to be important as well. There's mm. a lot of information, a lot of uh, vital information important to you personally, important to me personally, as well as for my job. And when you just talk about it, you feel confident, maybe nobody's listening or something like that, but they can be, and especially if it has to do with a computer or digital, then it's going to be out there. Mm -hmm. Anything you say, whether it's social media, whether it's potentially email, because we're seeing more and more data breaches out there. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen companies' emails leaked into the internet yeah. through different uh, data breaches and things like that. So more and more, when you're texting or com uh, comprising that email, you might rethink what would this look like <laughs> if it was out in the world, if the public could see this. Yeah. Exactly. Be careful what you say. It's being recorded probably somewhere. So we've got a few minutes left. Let's we'll combine. Let's combine Wi-Fi and VPN. So public Wi-Fi. I'm always freaked out and scared. We have VPN. So you know, uh, give us some advice on on those usages there. Sure. Public Wi-Fi. It's great. It's convenience, especially here in Honolulu and Hawaii, because we have a lot of tourists coming in, and, and I think more and more the cities are opening up there to have open Wi-Fi. Uh, but it's also extremely scary yeah. because when you're on open Wi-Fi, malicious people can essentially see all the traffic, all your web browsing potentially that, that you're going, anything that you're doing. If you're doing banking, they're going to potentially see that. So don't do banking. Don't do anything financial related yes, on never. open Wi-Fi. Don't do anything that, uh, basically anything that you want or worried anybody could be seen. So general web browsing, sure, that's probably okay. Uh, with VPNs, we can mitigate the open Wi-Fi problem using VPNs. Yes. Essentially, it's a tunnel into whether it's a secure server that you have or your work, and that is that secure tunnel is encrypted, and then people can't, even though you are on open Wi-Fi, can't read your traffic. Awesome. So October's National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. There are tons of trainings going on all over the state. Um, tomorrow, starting at Pearl Ridge downtown, there's a bunch of uh, InfraGuard folks are going to be there. So come on down if you want more information. Uh, use, uh, I think I should say, uh, your voice is important, so protect it. Thank you.